Uh, my name is Ilya. I work for WhatsApp, part of Meta. And uh, as Andreas already mentioned uh, this morning, in our code base in Erlang, we have quite much code. We have hundreds of applications. We have uh, thousands of modules. And we have millions of lines of code. And as Peter was talking uh, today as well, is that if you scale your system, then at some scale, you may have some very, very instant behavior that you didn't expect before. And we know from our experiences that uh, development at small scale and development at large scale, they may have very, very different challenges. And uh, a small history of WhatsApp code base, a little bit of history, uh, is that four years ago, it happened organically in our code base, we started speaking API. Start, we started speaking functions, uh, primarily public exported functions. And we also started using Dialyzer. Then uh, it took a little bit less than two years, but we got 100% of our code base under Dialyzer with many functions spec. And at the same time, uh, once we got it under Dialyzer, we started development of Equalizer. And the talk is about Equalizer, our type checker. It took us uh, one year to make it ready for internal use. Uh, we started using it internally. Uh, and a few months ago, what we got, we got 100% of our code base under Equalizer. And we have all public functions in our code base spec with types and specs. Uh, and this, this talk, uh, I will try to describe why we did it, how we did it, and a little bit of history and the landscape of the industry, what happened in uh, similar languages. So why did we start adding specs to our code? A uh, few reasons. The first reason is to use specs as documentation. We have quite many developers, and uh, developers may be jumping from one project to another project, and uh, we are trying to make changes uh, quickly. So development at scale means that you need to understand code, what code does, what code should not do, and so on and so on. So having specs as a form of documentation, it eases code navigation and also code understanding. And usually you add some documentation, and it was in our case, you add it a posteriori, just after you have already wrote, <coughs> written your code. On the other hand, when you start writing new code, specs allow you to document or to communicate your intentions, basically what should code should do and what it should not do. And it eases and it makes uh, code reviewing uh, much easier. And as I, can, as I can tell from my experience, this is a very, very natural step in scaling development in large code bases. So it happened to Erlang, and in Meta it happened to Python, to PHP, and to other languages as well, which were originally uh, fully dynamically typed. However, once you start doing this, you may run into some problems. So specs and types as documentation, they are basically the contracts about your code, what code is supposed to do. And it's not great if this documentation is lying, because instead of making code review faster, you can make them slower, because a reviewer may need to think whether this documentation is correct or not. Maybe this documentation is lying. And another thing is that uh, dialyzer, uh, this is the only thing that uh, we got that time. The Dialyzer check, checks specs and types, I would say, very, very tangentially. It's very different from classic traditional type checkers you would find uh, in languages like Haskell uh, <coughs> or Akamal. And also, the Dialyzer is quite slow on big code bases. Uh, partial solution to this was uh, that we have shipped and we have uh, contributed to incremental Dialyzer. Uh, on our 
in our code base, incremental dialyzer uh, was from 3 to 7x faster. And uh, Tom Davis uh, spoke about incremental dialyzer, uh, the implementation details uh, at CodeBeam here in Stockholm last year. So this is just a, a very, very tiny example uh, what is the difference between, let's say, traditional type checking and type checking performed by uh, dialyzer. So in this case, uh, the problematic place in this code is that uh, we have a function salted ID and it takes as a first parameter a value of the type ID. And here we may pass ID or undefined. So this is a logical error from the point of view of traditional type checking. If you run equalizer on this code, it would say that there is type error, there is mismatch. So this is how you run equalizer from command line, ELP equalize. And it says that this is the bad place, that we expect ID, but what we got is ID or undefined. If you run dialyzer on the same example, if you run dialyzer without any options, uh, it would be okay, no errors, no warnings. But if you run dialyzer with uh, the special option spec diffs, which is not recommended uh, to be done by official documentation, but nevertheless, if you run it, then you would get a little bit more cryptic message saying that there are some problems with your type specifications, that type specifications uh, go against something which is called success typing. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, nobody runs uh, in production, as far as I know, dialyzer with these options. So this is the difference. Uh, what is in the heart of equalizer and how we got here? Fifteen years ago, or uh, even more years ago, what happened in computer science is that uh, this year, uh, three, dif three different groups of computer scientists, they published approximately at the same time uh, three papers on exactly the same topic, which is now called gradual typing. Uh, gradual typing is a technique how you can introduce typing discipline into originally dynamically typed languages, like Python, Scheme, and so on. And it happened in industry to many other languages. So it happened to PHP. Facebook has uh, its own version of PHP. It's statically typed PHP, which is called Hack. But how we got here is that we got here from dynamic, uh, from gradual typing. Uh, there are different dialects of JavaScript, uh, flow used inside Facebook. There is a, uh, let's say, JavaScript dialect or a special language which is compiled down to JavaScript TypeScript, which is also based on the ideas of gradual typing. Uh, there are at least four different widely used type checkers for, for Python, MyPy, Pya, PyWrite, uh, PyType. Ruby got uh, very similar things recently, uh, the Sorbe type checker and uh, RBS, it's an, official, it's an official thing now from uh, Ruby 3.0. Uh, Roblox, uh, game dev company, uh, they made their own uh, type dialect of Lua, which is called Luau. And also very similar thing happened to Racket. Uh, Racket got the dialect called typed Racket. And uh, I mentioned typed Racket because actually under the hood, Equalizer got a lot of inspiration and technical inspiration from typed Racket. In the heart of gradual typing in turn, uh, there is a very, very special type which is called dynamic. And this type allows you to mix, let's say, typed code and untyped code. Dynamic is a very special type which says, I'm compatible with everything. I'm a good guy. Uh, if you think from the point of view of subtyping, and uh, Erlang uses the notion of subtyping, uh, we can say that the dynamic type is both 
bottom and top type of subtyping lattice. Now, it's not uh, fully correct, technically, because it's more, it's more subtle, but you can think this way. And uh, the next release of OTP, OTP26, uh, it got this dynamic type as a new built-in type recently. So there is this EEP, and uh, you can use this dynamic type, and Equalizer uses uh, this dynamic type. And all the languages that I mentioned, these corresponding type checkers, uh, which use subtyping uh, in the language of types, they have top type, bottom type, and the special dynamic type. And as you may see from this slide, naming is indeed a very hard problem. Very hard problem. So what we have in Erlang is that top type in Erlang is term and any. Uh, they are synonyms there, type aliases. Bottom type is called none or no return, and dynamic type dynamic. What we have in Python is that top type is object, bottom type is none, and dynamic type is called any. And you can see that uh, in TypeScript, it's unknown, never any, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, nevertheless, as you can see, it became the standard in the industry. And Equalizer is based on the ideas of using this dynamic type uh, to be able to bridge statically typed code and probably some dynamically typed or untyped code. Uh, a little bit of how we developed Equalizer. Uh, our main goal of developing this type checker was to make it practical for WhatsApp. What does it mean to be practical? It's, it may not be always easy to explain, so we try to use these bridges so that users are happy, users find it useful, that it is possible to adopt it gradually, that you need to stop the world, in order to adopt it, you can adopt it step by step. And also, we wanted to make it ergonomic part of our development workflow. And we have, uh, we use it from inside ID, we use it from command line, and also it's an organic part of our CI. As of now, uh, every change inside WhatsApp, it goes through CI and Equalizer is part of the CI. You cannot land, you cannot ship your code if this code doesn't pass Equalizer checks, if this code isn't well typed. And another thing uh, which we put as an explicit goal, when you develop a type checker, especially if you develop a type checker for already existing language like Erlang, you may have many, many options. You may go very, very strict, or you may go very, very lax and flexible. What we wanted to do, uh, we wanted to prioritize useful signal over noise. And another thing, we wanted to make the tooling, we wanted to make the experience uh, easy and welcoming for newcomers. Basically, if people already have some experience with TypeScript or typed Python or similar languages, then their experience in Erlang should be, should be quite similar. They don't need to learn uh, new things like success typing. And we also have explicit non-goals. And the main explicit non-goal was not to make it an academic tool. So we did not try to support in Equalizer every possible way you can write your Erlang program. So we wanted to support like the best practices, how you can write uh, your Erlang program. And we are discouraging people from using, let's say, questionable practices or questionable patterns, how you can write your Erlang code. Yeah, and these are the choices that we made. Uh, how Equalizer works internally, unlike Dialyzer, Dialyzer uh, works based on global inference. So it analyzes all your program, all your applications in one go. It infers many different facts, and then it uh, tries to find some bugs or errors or, warning, or warnings from the facts that it infers. Because of this global inference, the analyzer may be slow, and also because of this global inference, uh, some errors may be very, very cryptic to understand because 
the error may involve very different parts of your code base, and you need to look into different parts of your code base to understand uh, what's happening. So unlike dialyzer, equalizer is based on the ideas of local type inference based on specs. So what it does is that it analyzes the body of a function uh, completely independent from everything else. It takes the spec of a function as the source, as an original input, and then going through the body of a function line by line, it uses specs for other functions. And then it infers types of local variables and other things based on this information. It's widely used uh, industrial choice right now and uh, different type checkers which were originally based on the ideas of global type inference, for example, flow uh, for JavaScript originally used global inference. Now we see the trend that more and more tooling is migrating to, <coughs> to local type inference. Uh, mostly because of ergonomic things is that with local type inference, it's much easier to present and to explain what is wrong with your code rather than this global type inference. And also from the very beginning, we had two modes in our type checker. We had strict mode. Strict mode provides uh, very strong guarantees, but it, it is more restrictive. So it means that if you would like to migrate your code to strict mode, it may be a lot of refactorings and it may be a lot of rewrites. So it may not be suitable uh, out of the box. And also we have this gradle mode with this dynamic type and we actually implemented this gradle mode a little bit later. About choices, how we made choices. We took a data-driven approach. Uh, we assume that our WhatsApp code base is mostly okay-ish from the point of view of code quality and we tried to make uh, equalizer in a way that it doesn't produce bad noise in our code base, but produces uh, some good uh, signal. We did a lot of experiments with different options, with different design choices in our type checker, around different analysis, I bought them, and so on and so on. And as you may see from previous slides, other type checkers like Flow, TypeScript, uh, almost all of them were born inside big companies. TypeScript was born inside Microsoft. Uh, MyPy was born uh, technically inside Dropbox. Uh, why it happened this way? I think it happened this way partially because you can use your code base, especially if the code base is large, as this uh, input for design choices. because. We saw quite many experiments uh, in academia, uh, many attempts to implement type checker for Erlang to make it to make it something. But probably part of the problem was that you don't have uh, large code bases to test your type checker on. And I would like to talk a little bit about uh, graduality because uh, now gradual typing. Uh, it's not only the way how you can combine typed and untyped code, it's also a little bit of philosophy of how you can design the type system or the type checker and how you can evolve them. So Gradle typing is Gradle not because it's a mix, it's also because we are trying to move gradually uh, to some goal. And from the point of uh, what we do with the code base, the main goal but we are trying to achieve, uh, this is the goal of scaling our development. Gradual adoption, this is the same graduality. Gradual development of type checker. Uh, we had one year uh, developing type checker, but then we were also improving the type checker as it was already used in our code base. And another quite interesting and tricky thing is that in our case, it was possible to evolve or to co-evolve both type checker and our code base together. In a sense that if we saw that there were just some patterns used in code and they were used in two places, subtle, subtle patterns, it was okay for us not to support 
such patterns in the type checker in the first place, it was just okay to go and to fix those places in the code base. Yeah, uh, and we had, <clears throat> in our type checker, we, ha we have uh, things uh, for Gradle adoption, how you can uh, adopt uh, type checking step by step, module by model. This is how we went uh, with Equalizer. So originally, nothing was checked by Equalizer, and we started using this uh, marker, typing Equalizer. It means that this file or this module is, is enrolled into Equalizer, and it's checked by CI. Uh, this is one thing. Another thing is that uh, we have escape hatches, is that you can suppress uh, in, in a quite ergonomic way, uh, type errors or type warnings if you don't want to fix them right now, you can put this uh, special comment, equalizer fix me. And also you can enroll into equalizer application by application by putting this uh, equalizer marker. Yeah, so also we uh, had this gradual development. Uh, first we were focusing on making equalizer work and then making it faster and now probably we would add more features to this. So a little bit of timeline with more details and color how we got here. So uh, last year in January, internally Equalizer was uh, available to our users. We started working with one, uh, with one team in WhatsApp very closely to get them fully onto Equalizer by equalizing the project end to end. It took some time. In May, uh, this equalization was complete. Uh, then we saw some signs of, let's say, grassroots adoption, and in July last year we got 63% uh, of our code base under Equalizer, then uh, in December 94, and then it took uh, three months to cover the last 6%. And we have our everything type checked with enforcement of uh, speaking all public API, all, all exported functions. So the conclusions, uh, in our case, in our experience, in large projects, writing specs and t types for Erlang is beneficial. Uh, also in our case, ergonomics and flexibility, what you can and what you cannot do was critical for adoption. And another conclusion is that Erlang can be, type, can be typed at scale. Uh, these are the questions we are, we, are, we are getting almost every time when we try to talk about Equalizer. The first question is always, it's not written in Erlang, how so? Why not? Uh, but practically in our case, uh, when we, underst we understood the limitations of Erlang, and uh, frankly speaking, Erlang would not be a good choice for uh, for writing things like uh, like type checker or writing things like Rust analyzer, so we use it basically from from practical points of view. If we wrote it in Erlang, it would take much more time for us, and probably it would be uh, much much slower than we have it right now. Uh, what is the difference between Gradalizer between Equalizer versus Dialyzer? Uh, Equalizer is a type checker, dialyzer is not type checker, dialyzer is a code analysis tool. Uh, equalizer uses local type inference, dialyzer uses global type inference. There are ergonomic differences, but nevertheless, uh, tools do not contradict each other, and actually it was one of our design goals to make them friends, so that they can be used in the same code base. And actually, we are using them still together in our code base. We run both equalizer and dialyzer in our CI, command line, and so on and so on. Another question, what is the difference between equalizer and gradualizer? Because there is also an open source project written in Erlang uh, with similar ideas, which is called gradualizer. Uh, so the short answer maybe is that uh, equalizer is a practical tool. So we tried to use uh, Gradualizer for our code, ba code base, and the last time I tried it, it was uh, this week. The answer, it crashes. So it's not, uh, it's not practical from this point of view. It doesn't cover all possible cases you can run, you, you can write your code. 
not from the point of view of type checking, but just handling, handling this. Yeah, and also Grudalizer, as far as I know, it does not uh, support quite important things like uh, generics, polymorph inference uh, in polymorphic functions, and it may have problems with uh, quite complicated uh, recursive types. So these are the main questions we are all we are we are getting uh, very often. So thank you for your attention. Uh, it's open source; you can uh, try it. Uh, taken from GitHub, so thank you, and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Ilya. <laughs> Since the frequently asked questions have been already answered, we have time for one unfrequently asked question. Yep. So since you're at scale, do you have any quantitative evidence that it's helping? Yes. Like Reduced bugs. Yes, we fixed a lot of bugs. Yes, we fixed a, we, we fixed a lot of bugs, and uh, this thing it helped adoption very much because in the beginning I, I can say there was a little bit of friction, especially from old timers saying that do we do we need it? Probably we don't need it, but. After some initial adoption, after some initial coverage, when people start seeing that actually it reveals quite many bugs, people stop people stopped arguing about this. Yes, yeah, so they got some fun from from catching the bugs, and and actually, what also people got, some people got a lot of fun by just making our code base well typed. So this is why we have this funny wavy logo. The message is that static typing can be fun. Okay, thank you very much, Celia.